Good morning, church. My name is Judy Mills, and I serve on the prayer and women's ministry teams here at COTC. And it is my utter joy to be with you in person and live stream and read to you this morning's teaching text. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. This is Colossians 1, 1 and 2, and this is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. We back. We're back. It's happened. Feels good. Feels good. I don't know if you enjoyed looking at a screen. I hated preaching to one, but it is so good to be back here. And uh, honestly, it is, we're just so grateful for your faithfulness as a church. By the way, if you're live streaming and you're on the screen, I didn't really mean that. That was just a, cr a room dynamic for the people who are here. So we lo I love you. Love preaching to you on the screen. It is a joy to be with you. And uh, again, just this is what I signed up for you know, to follow Jesus together here in New York. So it is just wonderful to have you. And uh, I hope you're doing okay. I want to catch up, hear everything. Hope that you've uh, made it through okay. And I hope we take some time this summer really to process everything for the last few months. And uh, so we had a pretty light theme, which was pray and play. And uh, I hope you lean into that, which is just like fighting for joy again. And just reestablishing a connection of God and community, I think it's going to be a good few months together. Uh, we are going to start a new series today called The Life You Long For, because it seems like there was a thing we were trying to do with our lives and it got disrupted. And uh, we want to sort of like get back in touch with our heart to follow Jesus and what it means to be faithful to Him. And so what I want to do today is I want to set up what we're going to be talking about for the next three months with just basically an introduction to the book of Colossians. Now, the challenge with uh, books like Colossians is that we can often think this is just, you know, doctrine on a page from a long time ago. And we can, we can forget that it was real people in a real place struggling to be faithful to Jesus and follow Him in the complexities of their cultural situation. And so that's what I want to set up today. How was the church started? Who were the key people involved? What are the major issues that we need to unpack? And then what's the relevance for us here in New York? Now, I've noticed over the past uh, 16 months or so that a lot of the questions I get as a pastor seem to have gotten harder and harder. It used to be like, hey, how do I get connected in a group? You know, like it used to be sort of like, honestly, church pragmatics. Like, how do I do this? How do I get into this? What are the systems and the structures? And it just seems like it's just gotten way, way more complex. People are sort of wrestling with how to maintain a faith with a culture that doesn't seem particularly interested in helping you do that. Sometimes we struggle to, to figure out how do I maintain a life-giving distinctly Christian vision of sexuality and money and power in a society like ours. Sometimes there's a lot of suspicion whenever you tell people you're a Christian. There's just sort of a hermeneutic of suspicion that sort of comes over all of your behavior, and you, you sort of feel like you're always treading on eggshells, doing image management for Jesus. And sometimes with so much politics and division, we can sort of be going, I just, like, I know in my heart I want to follow Jesus. It just seems hard to figure out how to do that in the world as it continues to change. And then there's personal issues in our own hearts. How do I forgive people? A lot of people have experienced a lot of hurt. Is the forgiveness still something that really matters? And how do I do it? Or sometimes how do I avoid being self-righteous? Some people are so dumb and they believe such stupid things. You got any of that creeping up in your heart? We can be self-righteous about our opinions. We know that self-righteousness never draws anybody to Jesus. And then sometimes we can just be crippled with fear and anxiety just about our lives and the future. And so many things have changed. Sometimes we can just, like, just feel like God's absent, if we're honest. Like, where did God go? And it can be very, very challenging. So as the questions get harder... 
they normally sort of center around three issues. Number one's identity, which means like, what does it really mean to be a Christian? Like Christians talk about identity all the time, and we talk about identity politics, and we talk about different kinds of identities in our culture. What does it really mean to have a distinctly Christian identity? Secondly, how do I, how do I become a good person? This is the great quest of our age. Who are the good people? What is righteousness personally, culturally? Like who are the right people in the world? And then where do you get power to become one of those people? How is that fueled? Is it just willpower? Is it is external power? Is it maintaining a right opinion? Where does the energy come from to make to secure my identity and to make me into a righteous person? Well, wouldn't it be great, honestly, in the midst of all this complexity? Because I, I get this question all the time. Hey, are there any older folks in the church who could mentor me? It's like if we set up a mentoring ministry, it'd be maxed out in four minutes. It'd be like, it's like it's full, sorry. They had 100 spots, they're taken. I mean, it's, it's amazing how many people are like, I wish I could reach out to someone who's been through this before, who could walk me through this, who could give me some perspective and some wisdom. And I often think, gosh, I wish there was a church somewhere that had been through this, that I could get together with their leadership and be like, how do you handle this? How do you navigate challenges in your faith? How do you navigate putting off the flesh and walking in holiness in a, in a weird cultural time? Don't you wish you had somebody who would mentor you? And don't you wish you had a community who could guide you? Well, today we do. This is a passage about a pastor and a congregation struggling to, follow with Je- struggling to follow Jesus in very, very confusing settings. And then it's their mentor speaking into them with timeless biblical wisdom about how to follow it well. And that's what's actually I want to just unpack today in these first two verses. It's understanding the context of the community and then what it is that Paul's speaking into them. Now, I know that people have got like internet brains and their intention spans have been destroyed. So I'm shortening my talks now and I've alliterated them with like the absolutely simplest outlines of sermons you can do. So you're welcome. This is New Testament love, okay? So so I want to talk about, they all start with P. I want to talk about the people in this particular passage that we read about, it says here in verse 1, to the church in Colossae, and it's from Paul and Timothy. So what's the context of this setting? Well, you remember in the book of Acts, the book of Acts starts where Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's ascending to the Father. He sends the Holy Spirit on His people, and He bursts the church. And the church is that community where God dwells among them. They have Christ in them, the hope of glory. They're a new humanity in the midst of the world. And Jesus gives them a command, take this good news to the ends of the earth. And so the apostles start in Jerusalem, sort of at the center of God's redemptive activity, and now they spread that throughout the earth. And the book of Acts is the story of people taking the good news of Jesus to different cities and to different cultures. In Acts chapter 19, the Apostle Paul comes to a city called Ephesus, one of the three most important cities uh, in the Roman Empire, huge, huge uh, center, and he basically spends a long time there for an apostle, three years, spends a, a long time there building the church and speaking in, and he starts with the most common audience. He starts in the synagogue trying to reason with God's people, hey, Jesus is the Messiah for the Jewish people. But they get frustrated with him and they reject him. And so he moves outside of that and he starts a little ministry school, school the, the school of Tyrannus. And uh, he met at a very inconvenient time. And it's, it would sort of be the equivalent of saying, hey, I want to do like an in-depth, an in-depth Bible study and discipleship group. And it's going to meet from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. How many of you are in? A lot of people are like, yeah, I really like the idea, but it just doesn't work. Well, This little Bible study, this school of ministry that the Apostle Paul started, God just blessed it. And extraordinary things happened in the midst of it. And what happened in the midst of it was a a, a church planting movement. People began to take what Paul was teaching them. They'd go to the whole region. And so a whole series of churches were planted out of this Bible study at this really inconvenient time. In Acts chapter 19, it says this, the whole region heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And that would be like, the ho- imagine doing a Bible study between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., and it gets so much momentum, it's like the entire Northeast heard the word of Jesus Christ. You'd be like, what a Bible study, so strong. 
This is what happened. And in this, two people in particular were converted. The first one was Epaphras. We read about him in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, and then in Acts 19, verse 10. And then Philemon, if you see Philemon, uh, verse 19, these were two leaders who in the school of Tyrannus really encountered Jesus. And they carried the message of the gospel back to the place where they were from, back to the city of Colossae. They also went to Laodicea and Hierapolis, which is two uh, other towns that were around from them. And what, what's, by the way, so encouraging about this, these don't seem to be, from our understanding, like officially sent apostolic leaders. We don't see like the apostles, all the leaders in Ephesus gather around them, lay hands on them, take up an offering and send them out. It seems like they just took the gospel and they just ran with it. And I love that because what it shows us is that God is just looking for hungry people, available people, period. That's the qualifications of God. And if you're available and you're hungry and you're willing to surrender your life, God can do extraordinary things to you. So we have a letter in the New Testament just to a church that was just started by somebody who just loved Jesus and took the good news of the gospel back to where he was from. And you've got to imagine, you can imagine uh, sort of a paraphrase, he comes back to Colossae, he's like back in town, pops in for a flat white to get started, starts connecting with all of his friends, is walking around the city, does like a little intro group. Hey, I'd like to talk to you about um, some great news I've heard from another part of the empire. People gather around and the church is born. And it would have been challenging because, uh, which brings me to point two, by the way, um, which is the place where it happened. It's a city that was located on the Lycus River. It was on an east-west trade route, so it's, it was a very, very diverse city and uh, thoroughly you know, multicultural, multi-religious. And here he gets a gathering of these people. And so you would have had like pagans and you would have had people who were living these like, you know, very, very licentious lifestyles according to sort of Jewish traditions and understanding. It would, it would have been like, and then you get them all in a room and they bring in all of their baggage, their former religions, their former understanding, their former practices. And now they've got to hash out how to, how to become this new humanity and be disciples of Jesus. And at first, everyone's loving it. They love the worship. There's hand raising. There's shed singing. It's going great. And then all of those problems from the culture and those problems from their past, they begin to sort of bubble up and it begins to sort of impact the group. And so Epaphras doesn't quite know what to do. Turns out pastoring's harder than he thought. After the initial wave of excitement, and so he doesn't quite know what to do. So he goes back and this book is written from Rome. It's Paul's first Roman imprisonment. We see the book of Acts as it continues. Paul gets imprisoned in Rome, and it says that he spent two years talking about the kingdom of God. So he was under house arrest, but he had quite a lot of autonomy. People could come visit him, and he had a lot of agency to basically continue his ministry. And it's, that's the place that he wrote this particular letter from. The second imprisonment where he wrote uh, 2 Timothy, where he's about to die. But this one here, he's still got some movement, still got some agility. So Epaphras comes to visit Paul, and he's like, Paul, and you, you imagine this meeting. You go into the front door, and there's like a, a Roman guard there, and he's like, hey, how's it going? It's good. Here to see Paul. He's like, all right, let me check. You know, lets him in. They sit down, and Paul's going to be like, how's it going? He's like, oh, mate, pastoring so much harder than I thought. Well, what's going on? You can see Paul sort of sitting down. And he's like, tell me, like, what are people saying? What are they wrestling with? What are the challenges? What are the struggles? You can almost see like Paul taking notes about trying to diagnose and understand like what it is that is sort of impacting and causing problems with the people. And so as a result of this visit from Epaphras to the Apostle Paul, he writes a letter to the church at Colossae and he gives them his wisdom and his insight and his understanding about the threats they face to living in the freedom that God has for them. Third thing, the problem. What was the problem? I, I think when you read this epistle and you sort of get this from the things that the Apostle Paul addresses, it basically falls into two categories. Number one, sort of excessive Jewish legalism. And number two, sort of pagan mysticism, sort of proto-Gnosticism, an early form of Gnosticism, which I'll talk about in, the, in just a second. There was two challenges that sort of rose up. The, the first one is that, and, and we've got to be patient with these people. We've got to have mercy on these people because taking their understanding of the gospel and the covenants and the story of Jesus and then trying to hash that out 
was just as challenging as it was for them as it is for us. Maybe even more so because they were sort of making it up as they went along. They didn't have 2,000 years of New Testament history to draw on. And so you had um, moments like there's one in, in Acts chapter 15 where as the gospel is getting further and further away from a Jewish context, people begin to ask the question, how much of Jewish culture and tradition do you have to practice if you're not Jewish to be accepted by God. And so there's like a, a lot of confusion here. And some folks who were Jewish is like, you gotta, you got to do the whole thing. And not, not, in a, not even necessarily like in a works righteousness, but like they just couldn't comprehend of a gospel sort of that didn't carry with it all of the trappings of Jewish culture. And they realized it was getting harder and harder to bring sort of impose cultural distinctions that weren't required in the gospel on people who weren't from that particular culture. So they sort of got, got the essence down. They had a big council in Acts 15, and they basically said, hey, look, like you've got to have a distinctive sexual ethic. You've got to be very, very concerned about what you do with idolatry and how that functions in your midst. They try to make it as simple as possible. But some of these folks sort of doubled down, and they became like the Judaizers, and they basically began to say, no, you have to do more of the ceremonial thing. God requires these for your acceptance. And it was beginning to mess up a predominantly Gentile church. And so they're like trying to figure it out. So you see the Apostle Paul address this. He talks about ceremonialism in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. He talks about circumcision, food and drink and rules and kinds of food. And he talks about asceticism where they say, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Talk about worship, worshiping angels in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 18. And so on one side, you've got these folks sort of chasing, wherever, chasing the gospel down to sort of bring more rules and regulations over the top of it. And it was messing up their community. And the second one, you had these pagan dynamics from the Greco-Roman culture. A lot of these people's past coming and messing the group up. And so they were sort of de-emphasizing the centrality and beauty of Jesus. And some of them believed there was like a secret knowledge. There were secret layers to the kingdom of God, secret mystical experience. And Jesus wasn't enough. The Holy Spirit wasn't enough. There was this super spiritual people and you had to access this super deep teaching. Otherwise, you were not complete. And there was a lot of reliance on human wisdom and human understanding. Now, I just, I want to say this. I want you to imagine that you're in a community group and your group is cranking, you are playing and praying so hard, it is incredible. And then all of a sudden, someone joins your group from a different city, and they come into the group, and they introduce all of these traditions and rituals, and they say, if you don't do these specific things, you're a second-rate citizen in the kingdom of God. And like, you're like, I look, man, I don't, I'm just trying to still figure this out, maybe. And so you do like a little bit of it and you start introducing these things. And then your group begins to sort of calcify around these secondary issues and it gets really legalistic. And then all of a sudden, it, it doesn't even look like a group that was about Jesus anymore. It's about all of these secondary things. And you're really upset. And so you're like, Epaphras, my group's in trouble, man. This stuff has snuck in and it's, it's messing with our community. Or well, someone else comes in and they're bringing basically paganism into the group. And they're saying, yeah, I know, that the, I know that the apostles say this about Jesus, but trust me, what do they know? I've got real knowledge. I've got real insight. I've got real understanding. So there's sort of a challenge to apostolic authority. There's a challenging of God's word. There's a challenging of the beauty of Jesus. And so you can imagine being in a group. Have you ever been in a group that goes south? Don't put your hands up. Not in our church, okay? But... Groups can go south, communities can go south because there's things that sneak in and mess them up. And so these are the problems that Paul is trying to address because he wants the church to prosper. He wants people to, to thrive. And so he addresses these two distinct problems. And look, if we were honest today, we live at a moment where things can sneak into our church. People can import their past. People can import secularism in. People can bring in challenges to biblical authority. And all of a sudden, groups that are designed to bring life just get destroyed by legalism and, and death and cynicism and all these other philosophies come in. It just, it, it's something. It's just not what Jesus had in mind anymore. And look, we, we have to not be like judgmental of people who are struggling right now because it's very, very hard. 
People don't know how to get a secure sense of identity. They want to be the good people, and they're looking for all these cultural mechanisms to tell them that if they live a certain way, they're not one of them, they're one of them. And everybody's looking for power to change their lives. And so a lot of people in our world today with good intent get involved in bad things that are destroying them. Dallas Willard says this, the hunger of the human heart that is unfed by what is authentic will go for what is inauthentic. If human beings need something vital badly enough, they may even destroy themselves trying to get it. And there's a lot of people who are looking for that vital sense of identity and righteousness and power. They're just looking in the wrong places and they bring that into the church and it can be messy too. Part four, the purpose. Paul writes this because he wants the church to properly value Jesus. He's like, don't sell Jesus short. You will never come up with somebody more beautiful and compelling and wonderful than the person of Jesus. And so there was an assault on the person of Jesus. And so Paul begins to really get into this, and we'll address this in a couple of weeks. He says that Jesus is the very image of God. If you want to know what the invisible God is like, read the Gospels and look at Jesus because Jesus shows us what God is like. And then he says, Jesus isn't just a man, though. He's also the creator, verse 16. He's the pre-existent sustainer of all things, chapter 1, verse 17. He's the head of the church, verse 18. The first to be resurrected is a promise of what will happen to us because of salvation. Verse 19, he's, he's the fullness of God in bodily form. He's the one who reconciles all things. And then he has this beautiful phrase, chapter 2, verse 10, in Christ you have been brought to fullness. And what he's wanting him to know is like, listen, you haven't maxed out Jesus yet. You think you need legalism or philosophy? Trust me, you're just shallow in Jesus. Take the hunger and the longing, put it into exploring the riches that you have in Jesus. So he wants the whole thing to be about faithfulness to Jesus. Secondly, he wants the church to enjoy the freedom of salvation. In Colossians 2.16, he says this, do not let anyone judge you. We are a judgmental society. My gosh, we would give the Pharisees a run for their money. On any cultural issue today, so much judgment. Don't believe me? Take your mask off in Brooklyn and see what happens. I'm just, I feel like I haven't really thrown any shade on Brooklyn for like almost two years now. During the pandemic, more people moved to Brooklyn from Manhattan than to Florida. Brooklyn's on fire. I love you, Brooklyn. But <laughs> thank you. Freedom. So the church is supposed to be a place of freedom. So in chapter 2, verse 80 says, I don't want you to be taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophy. It looks great on the outside. You get into it, it's empty. And he says, I don't want you to believe that these ideologies have power to restrain your flesh. He says, they look amazing on the outside, but they actually don't have the power to internally change your heart. And I think it's important because we, the, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus died to set us free. And if we don't value our freedom, we are not modeling what it is that Christ came to give us. Jesus, it says in the book of Galatians, it is for freedom that you have been set free. And so we should be free from sin, free from human opinion, free from our past, free from secular ideologies, free from legalism. We are a free people. We should live in this freedom. And so Paul is writing not to beat them down, not to judge them. He is writing to bring freedom. And then lastly, his vision was for that they would be formed. It was a vision of formation. And he has this beautiful verse, Colossians 1, verse 23 says this, he is the one, verse 28, he is the one we proclaim. So he's talking about Jesus. And we admonish and teach everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Fully mature in Christ. And what a beautiful phrase. And this is one of the I think what this book contains some of the most beautiful teachings of what it means to be in Christ. They were in Colossae, but they were also in Christ. 
And this reality of being in Jesus was the dominant reality, even in the midst of their particular location. And so he wanted them to experience this change. And so he gives them three encouragement. Number one, he says, I just want to remind you, verse one, he says, he calls them saints. To the saints in Colossae. Now, when you and I think of saints, we're like Mother Teresa doing like a 40-year stint, like serving the poor. And these people weren't doing Mother Teresa. They were just doing following Jesus in Colossae. He says, a saint is about who Jesus has made you. It's not what you do for God. It's what he's done for you. You are positionally perfect in the sight of Jesus, uh, in the sight of God because of what Jesus has done for us. So he says, he calls them saints. They're forgiven. Secondly, he calls them family. He says, you have a new father who's giving you grace and peace, and you have brothers and sisters. And I like a community of belonging. He says, this is who you are now in Jesus. And he tells them, he calls them the faithful in Christ Jesus. He says, you, you, you're doing well. You're doing so well. Do not let these forces sabotage your faithfulness and your freedom and your formation in Jesus. And honestly, when I look at the rebuilding of New York, when I look at what it means to be a disciple of Jesus today, I, these things are still three things that we wrestle with today. Identity, righteousness, and power. Who am I? How do I become one of the good people? And where do I get the power to do this and sustain this? And if the Apostle Paul was to write a letter to our church, I think he would address these issues. I think he would talk to us about resisting legalism that sabotages us and resisting paganism which deforms us. And he would exhort us to be faithful to Jesus, to be a family of freedom together with one another, and to stay faithful regardless of what happens outside the walls of the church. So that's it. That's my introductory talk for today. But I do want to just give you this one practice. Pastor Susie put this on her Instagram. If you don't follow her, just give her a follow. <laughs> She's dropping knowledge over there. She, she said this. She said, if you are in our church and you're going to the book of Colossians, she said, why don't you just read the book of Colossians every day? It takes between 11 and 15 minutes, depending on how quick you read. You know, which is basically like 59th Street to 42nd Street at 8.30 a.m. or something. It's not, it doesn't take long. And if you can't read it every day, you could read it once a week. Because here's what I want us to see. I, I, our goal is not just, here's all of our study and thoughts on the book of Colossians. Our goal is that you encounter the freedom that Jesus brings through the book of Colossians. And so I want to encourage you, why don't you create like a new little summer ritual and maybe before you go to bed, you're like, let me just bang out Colossians. If it's too much to read the whole book, you could read just one chapter, Colossians 1 or chapter 2. I mean, each, I'm thinking through them right now. They're beautiful, beautiful chapters. So why don't you just make this your application for the summer? And I tell you, if you read it every day or once a week, you'll be amazed at how much it starts to get into your heart. It'll change your thinking. It'll change your motives. You see Jesus in ways you've never seen Him before. You'll sense faithfulness rising inside of you. You'll be able to identify paganism and legalism that could mess up your discipleship. You begin to value other people who are walking with you in freedom and following Jesus. And I think if 13 weeks from now or so, this stuff was hidden in our hearts, I think it would get us into the fall in a beautiful place as a church because we'd be formed, we'd be free, and, uh, and I think we'd be really ready for what God has in store for us. So that's it for today. A community in a city struggling with forces trying to sabotage their faith. A wise mentor speaking to them about the beauty they have in Jesus and an invitation to be faithful in the midst of it all. And I want us to sort of close our uh, service in, in response today and basically just acknowledging that for a lot of us, talking about these things isn't just theoretical either. It's a challenge. It'll be a challenge to us. A lot of folks, you know, a lot of people got sort of caught up in stuff. Sometimes folks feel distant, distant from God. And uh, I would love us just in our first official gathering back together just to be able to say, Jesus, that's right. You are about freedom. You are for me. You're about life. 
and I acknowledge that there's these forces that are at war for my heart. And Jesus, I just need you to come and just give me a fresh touch. And just remind me how to be faithful. And uh, so I just want to lead us just into a time of response. And um, so if, you, if you're just in that place where you're like, man, I'm just like a touch weary or I've just been through a lot and I feel sort of beat up and battered around. And I just would love to leave church with a fresh encounter with the, the presence of God today. If that's you, without any pressure or whatever, just encourage you to put your hands out in front of you. And I just want to pray a special prayer of blessing over you. Just want to pray that God will draw near to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that you just be reminded of the beauty of Jesus and the freedom that you have in Him. And so let's just take a moment to enter into God's presence together. Father, we just want to say thank you that we have been brought into your family through the good news of Jesus. And we thank you that your word has not just come from a movement in Jerusalem to a city in the Roman Empire. Lord, it's come from Jerusalem to Manhattan. We're here. And we just want to say thank you that that beautiful message of freedom and hope and family and life that it's found us here today. We just say thank you for saving us. Thank you for bringing us into the community of Jesus. And uh, Lord, we just say thank you that we can just gather together today as your people. Lord, it's so good to see each other's faces. And Father, as we gather, Lord, we're just reminded that we are fundamentally a community of love. And Lord, we just want to come to you in honesty and just acknowledge that this, this has been a hard season. There's a lot going on and many of us feel beat up and torn and battered or many people feel like they're just questioning things or they're disoriented and Father we as your word says just want to cast all our cares on you because you care for us and so Lord we just bring our anxiety and our uncertainty we bring our sin and our struggles to you and Lord we just bring our whole selves good, bad, ugly but just we bring our whole selves to you and we just present ourselves to you in a fresh way. And we just, just pray, Lord Jesus, would you just come and have mercy on us? Jesus, we're just calling on your heart of love and mercy. And Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would just walk through these aisles and you would just minister life, peace, joy, hope to my brothers and sisters who are here. Father, I just pray that you would just remind them of their true identity. They are who you say they are, not who the culture says. Lord, I just pray that you would show them the beauty of what it means to be made righteous in you. All of our sins forgiven. All of our shame taken away. Nothing but love and acceptance because of Jesus. And Father, I just want to pray that you would just, just release fresh power. Lord, I just pray living water would begin to just rise up in the hearts of those who are hungry and those who are weary. Lord, I just pray that as we drink from you, there would just be a deep satisfaction, a reminder, a freedom from exhaustion, and that there would just be life. And so, Lord, on our first day back, to the saints here in Manhattan, Lord, we just say we love you and we're just so honored to be your people and we just want to experience the fullness of freedom and formation that you have for us in Jesus. And we just present our church to you again and just pray, move among us. We pray this in Jesus' name.